Today's date, October 26, 2005. Interviewee, Ethel Archibald. Birthday, January 6, 1915. Current address, Warren Guest House, Warren, Arkansas, 71671. Place of interview, Warren Guest House. Interviewer, Rob Bree. Videographer, Chris Norton. Um, what branch of service did you uh, serve in? When I first went in in 1943, it was WAAC, Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which was not a part of the Army at that time. Um, what, what wars uh, were you a part of? From World War II, I was at Camp Robinson, Arkansas with a hospital unit. We're in Korean War, I was in Japan, logistics behind the line. Uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? Pardon? Were you drafted or, or did you enlist? Oh, I went in, we, in, we went in in 43 just uh, indefinite. You didn't enlist. You just went in indefinite. Then after the war was over, we, who had gained enough points, could get out if we wanted to, which I elected to get out. Where were you living at the time? Time Bluff, Arkansas. Uh, why, uh, why did they have y'all join? Why did you join? Okay, excuse me. You're going to have to sit closer to me or something. Okay. I'm not able to understand you at that distance. Okay. I'm sorry. That's fine. We can either move that table and you pull your chair up closer. Okay. Why did you join? I had two brothers in service. Both of them volunteered. Both of them overseas. I was the one of three girls, I'm the only one eligible to go in service, and I decided I would go in. I enlisted in Pine Bluff, was interviewed in Little Rock, and then sent to Fort Devens, Mass, for my training. Do you recall your first days in service? Oh, yeah. Uh, what did it feel like? Well, I don't know. It's a kind of feeling that you were in another world. You were no longer a part of civilian life. I was with a battalion of women. Who was there. As far as you could see, you could see women. And it was a, just a, a feeling of, of doing something worthwhile that I was training for, and that's what I wanted to do. Uh, what was your training experience like? Well, I, while we were at the training center, uh, our, we, had, we were chosen by whatever when we took a test, whatever test you came out best in is what they put you in. And because I knew what a screwdriver and a sledgehammer and stuff was used for, they put me in the motor pool. Uh, do you remember your instructors? No. That was 1943. <laughs> uh, how did you get through your training? I did real well. In fact, uh, just before we went over from WAAC to WAC, we were given a choice to relieve the service. I didn't want that, but I was having trouble with uh, uh, bend, uh, uh, breaking my ankle on rocks because Fort Davis is noted for its rocks. A young lieutenant in the Army wanted to operate on my feet, and he said he could adjust my, the arches in my feet by cutting a leader in the back of my ankle. It didn't make sense to me. I went to the commanding officer and immediately she said, no, don't do that. We're going over to the Army, take that, get out and go to your own doctor and have him treat your feet and there's no way they can ever build an arch in your foot. And he said I either would get out or he would have me court martial because we were not a part of the Army. So I got out and I stayed out I think about nine months. Uh, during that time, I went to an orthopedic doctor, had braces made for my feet and everything, re-enlisted in and came back. Uh, where exactly did you go while you were in service? Like what places? Well, from Fort Devens, I came back. To, I re-enlisted. I had to go to Fort Oldenburg, Georgia for reassignment. From there, I went back to Camp Robinson by request because my mother was my dependent. Went back to Camp Robinson. I think 
I stayed there uh, until the until the war was over. And then we got out on the point system. I got out and stayed out. Let's say I got out in 45. I stayed out until 48. During that time, I drove the school bus and worked in the library and drove a bookmobile. After I went back in service in October 48, I went to Fort Lee, Virginia for reassignment. After they pushed us around a while, I was sent to Fort Devens, uh, I mean to Fort George Meade. Uh, stayed there and they sent me back to Fort Lee, Virginia to Quartermaster School. I left there and came back to Fort Meade and was on orders to Japan in July 49. I went to Japan I was over there a little over three years. I was with pictorial services to begin with and then it was a slow system of, of uh, promotions. And those of us who were seeing it asked if we could take another assignment and they let us go to personnel. And I wanted to be more a part, during this time, the Korean situation had broken out. I wanted to be more a part of it, so I asked for logistics and went to Second T Major Court, which was logistics behind the line. Um, what was your job assignment? At, at the logistics? Yes. Well, the, the forward units, 8th Army especially, which I was a part of, would send back their requisitions to us of what material they needed, anywhere from toilet paper to uh, marine engines for ships. And we would fill these requisitions out and ship it to them. But if they wanted ammo, weapons, and things like that, we had to put it on a barge, send it out in the breakwater, and then load it on the ship to Korea because it couldn't be loaded within the city at the regular port which was in Yokohama. Um, did you ever see any combat? No. I saw the returning men and helped take care of them. We worked our regular jobs during the day, and then we'd go to the 155th Station Hospital at night in Tokyo General and help with the men coming in. And they were so, the hospitals were so loaded that they had the men on litters just lined up on the hallways and we were told to find those who needed help that we thought would live if they had help right away because we were limited on our doctors. We didn't know too much about the medical field, but we still had to be used. And we would get these men into the operating room or wherever they need to go as soon as possible to try to save as many men as we could. But as many of them I know that were overlooked because the lack of people to take care of them. Uh, did you ever have any memorable experiences? Such as? I anything at all, just um, any jokes you played with friends, uh, anything anything at all? Well, I think one outstanding thing I had in Japan, uh, we would take leave time any time we could get it. But we, I had a week coming to me, and uh, the barrack sergeant and I decided we'd go up in the mountains to a Japanese hotel, which we were authorized to use if we wanted to. And we went up there, we went up in, I had a Jeep. So we went up in my Jeep, right straight up to the mountainside, and we pulled into the town, and two soldiers stepped out and stopped us, the Japanese. They had red bands on their arms, and we immediately knew that we were in red territory. And, Jack, and they're noted for their red territory over there. They pushed us out into the back seat, uh, what would be a back seat, a uh, jeep, and they got in the front and took off with us. We had no idea what they were going to do because we didn't speak Japanese and they didn't speak English. But we showed them our paperwork and they could read the name of the hotel where we were going. So they took us there. Well, when they got through talking to the people, they decided to hold us then under guard. And we were limited to what we could do, and we had a guard on us all the time. I remember the one that guarded us the night, he had fingernails look like claws. I had a camera with a tripod to it, and I put that tripod under my pillow. I thought if he attacks one of us, at least I'll fight it. 
long as it can. But we stayed there then almost our entire week under guard until they finally got in touch with the Army to find that we were legally in that part of the country. They released us, and we went back into the company, and we agreed that we would not tell them what happened because we didn't, didn't, we didn't want it publicized. And uh, so we never did tell them what really happened to us up there. We weren't AWOL, we were still covered with leave time. I think that's one of the most outstanding things that happened to me while I was there. Uh, were you ever awarded any medals or uh, citations? Oh, yeah. Uh, how did you get them? Well, during uh, World War II, we were given several different medals. Um, somewhere I wrote those down. I believe they were on another piece of paper that I sent to you. We were awarded several different types of ribbons and medals for wartime service and for the hospital unit that I was assigned to was receiving the returning soldiers and processing them. Then, of course, we all, I think we then was six months, that you spend six months and you get uh, the, common, the uh, good conduct medal. After that, I think it turned out to be a year or something. After that was what during World War II in Japan, I got the Occupation of Japan Medal. I got the Korean Service Medal because I was logistics behind the line. Um, I went to France. I think I got the German Medal there. I don't know they're listed. I'm I'm, I'm sorry I can't remember. I have nine. Then I got them. The Missile Man badge was something that was with the missile program at one time. Uh, I don't know whether they call it sharpshooter or what, but with 45, I was expert with 45, Army 45. Um, how did you stay in touch with your family? Just by letter. By letter. Uh, what was the food like? It was all dried, everything dried. We got that's very seldom now this speaking of overseas, we seldom ever received fresh foods until they started doing hydroponic stuff. And then sometimes we were lucky enough. Our mess hall accommodated over three thousand people. So it was you didn't get specials or anything. You ate what was on the line. And that's where too I learned to eat what was put in front of me and shut your mouth. Um, did you always have plenty of supplies? As far as we were concerned, we had plenty of supplies, but the fellows up front didn't. We couldn't get the supplies to them fast enough. Did you ever feel any pressure or stress? Oh, yes. When you worked all day and then they walk in and say, you're going up to the hospital to work on midnight, uh, if it's something that we had no idea what we were doing, that was stressful, looking at all those men. Some of them shot all the pieces, and, and, uh, and when Korean War first started out, the Koreans did not have weapons. They had bamboo sticks. When you sharpen a bamboo stick the other side with the last joint on it and ram that through a man, you don't pull it back. So the field hospitals would saw it off next to his body and send him on in to 155th Station Hospital in Tokyo General. Then he was up to the doctors there to try to save him. And that was something to see. Was there ever anything uh, special that you did for good luck? Uh, anything special what? For good luck, that you did that you did for good luck? Uh, like keep a, a bracelet or any type of charm? Anything, uh, maybe a superstition? Not that I know of. Uh, how did people entertain themselves? As troops? Yes. Well, we, uh, we can, when the men began to come back into Japan, now you're speaking of my time in Japan. Yes, ma'am. Um, when they began to come back on five days, well, they take three day R&R, &R, <coughs> most from Okinawa and different places around. We had special hotels set up to entertain them. They would call the white company and ask us to send 
group of women up that they had so many men coming in. We would go up, we'd take a weekend plus a three day pass. This way we got the first group, part of their time, and part of the second group. So there was always a variety of people, and we would entertain them, dance with them, we always had a good band, and we'd dance with them, eat with them, boat ride with them, the things that they wanted to do. Uh, Captain Butters was in charge of this one motel, or hotel where I went, and he had a regulation. He says, the women are on one floor, the men on the other floor. The contacts you make will be on the dance floor, entertaining the men, if the men want to run around at night, they'll go to the village. They will not get on the, the go up where the women were or down where the men were. He would he ran it right, which we appreciated. Uh, what did you do when you were on leave? When I was on leave, well, I only took two leaves while I was over there. One I served under guard. The second one I was at Mickey Moto's Pearl Farm when the Korean situation broke out. And I didn't get to finish my leave time. They called us back in. See, we were great army. We were in a compound of Quonset huts. The women were in one compound, the men in another compound. And we went to the mess hall the morning after they were shipped out, and no men. Now, they actually shipped out at night without us knowing about it. Big trucks and everything, we still didn't know about it. When we went to Mass Hall and found out we had had no men around us, it was scary because we knew we were in red territory. So then they, of course, made it closer on us of, of uh, walking guard on the bamboo fences that we were enclosed in, and they actually put Japanese people that worked for the government on guard. But they still threw fire bombs in on us in the barracks and places, and you just got used to it of being able to so somebody stay awake long enough to throw them out. We no one was ever hurt that I know of. The only time we were ever hurt was when we were in a typhoon. Uh, what did you think of the officers and the fellow uh, women that were around you? Well, I always was lucky. I always had the best, I think. We all, they, did, they did what they were supposed to do. They were good people. When we were overseas, they didn't go. Uh, we're different overseas than we are in the States. Uh, they more or less uh, socialized with you to a great extent, treated you like a human being instead of a soldier, and they got to depend on some of us for different things. Um, my commanding officer at Yokohama depended on me fully and completely before she would her first sergeant. She said, I know if I leave the company at night that you're going to see that everything's all right. Of course, there's a battalion. And usually I get the women off. We had a whack club within the compound. The back entrance opened into the compound. You didn't have to go outside. And I worked in a club a lot to maintain it, to make sure that no one was injured, the women weren't mistreated or anything. Those that got out of hand, I took them back through the back of the club and put them out the back door. And then had someone take them to their, their, their hut. Uh, did you keep a personal diary of any type? No, other than just a copy of my orders, pictures of schools I attended, um, and things like that. It's personal, no, I didn't do that. Maybe I should have. I, I, I think of the one thing I've got going for me is a pretty good memory. Now, General Vaughn, with the Women's uh, Memorial, has tried to get me to write a book because I can still remember the little things that a lot of the old timers can't remember anymore. In fact, we don't have too many left that was in the WAAC. We had to be 21 when we went in then, and that was 1943. So there's not too many left. Do you recall the day your service ended? Uh, do, you, do you recall the day that you, that you got out, that you were done with your service? Oh, yeah. Uh, where were you? I was at Fort Bliss, Texas. I had an inspection team that traveled throughout Texas and New Mexico. We were what we call high logistics. We activated and deactivated t &E units, audited their books, checked their units, checked all everything they had to make sure 
of what was going on. We had over 400 books that we had to audit within a year, scattered throughout two states. I was fortunate enough to uh, get the men to take the out-of-state things, and they would hitch rides from Biggs Air Force Base. And during the time I was there, I would, on spare time, when I'd get the team working, I would go back to the educational center and teach the supply course to make sure that these people were aware of what we were looking for. We fell direct under a one-star general at Fort Bliss. We were higher than the IG teams. Um, did you make any close friends while in service? Oh, yeah. They're all dead down but two. I got one, well, there's two in Everett, Washington. One's in her late 90s and the other's in her late 80s. That's the only ones that I have any contact with. Um, did you ever join any type of veterans organization of any type? Uh, uh, did you ever join um, the American Legion or anything like uh, that? American Legion, then I dropped out because I had no activity here. I'm a lifetime member of VFW and DAV and the WAC uh, Association. Um, what did you go on to do as a career after your service ended? My service ended in 71, and I decided that I would go to school. Well, first, I, when they first gave me my six months transition, I just took six months and went to the educational center and taught. After I got out of that, I went to school. And I was, oh, I guess a couple of months through school, and a friend of mine approached me to come work for him with Dale's Mobile Chalet, one of the biggest mobile chalet companies in Texas, as a parts manager. I took over there as parts manager, and he fired the uh, secretary and two or three of the other people and didn't replace them. He said, I know you, you can replace them. And I couldn't hold up under it. I said, I'm working seven days a week, and at night and everything else, you've got to help me now. He wouldn't do it. And I said, well, things are going to get messed up, and you're going to cuss me. And when you do, I'm, I'm leaving you. I said, I know you're used to cussing people, because I knew him personally. And one Saturday morning, he came in and asked me how many air conditioners were in the warehouse. I said, I have no idea, because you won't listen to me. I said, every time a man draws an air conditioner to put on a unit, he doesn't come through me for it, so I have no idea, but I can go down to the warehouse and count them for you just in a few minutes. And he started cussing me. I walked over to the cash register, counted my money, bagged it, took it up to the main office, and handed it to his wife and said, good day. Um, was your education uh, supported by the GI Bill? Yes. I went to uh, drafting school under them, and I went to um, woodwork. I learned to make furniture. Um, did your military experience, uh, did it influence your thinking of war and the military? Influence what? Your, your thinking of, the, uh, of, of war and, and the military? Did, did it affect you, the, way you, the way you think about war in any way? I'm sorry, I don't get just what you're after there. Uh, did in any way, did, you, did your mind change in any way about war? Oh, yes, definitely. And uh, it, it, it used to really, when I first got out, it bugged me when anybody would ask me a question, and then it seemed to just go right off the top of the head. I realized most civilians didn't know what was going on around them, and there was no way to talk to them. So we were, most of us were confined with our conversations. We'd have to hunt other people who had been in service to actually be able to carry on a good conversation until I could adjust myself to civilian life then. Um, do you attend any type of reunions, military reunions in any way? Yeah, do I. Do you, do you attend any reunions with any, uh, with the WAC or anything like that? Yes. I went, oh, it's been about five years ago, I went to Seattle to the Northwestern Reunion. And the people there that I knew are all dead now. They just said, bing, 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 they has gone. My old company commander from Yokohama was one of them, Errol Stout. Um, how did 
your service and experiences affect your life afterwards? Well, I would say I was a different person completely. And I always suggest to any young person who was eligible for any branch of service to go in service for at least three years to let it uh, teach them there's more to life than the street and parties. They were disciplined, they would learn what it's all about and have more respect for the military and for the wars that we were getting into all the time. And I did a lot of recruiting on the side. Is there anything else you would like to add that we haven't covered? Well, during the time I was in service, I, I covered a multitude of things, naturally, with 24 years. I served as a first sergeant, I served as supply sergeant, I served as a drill sergeant, I spent four years as CID, as criminal investigator, a year out of that at undercover work at Walter Reed. I worked in and out of the Pentagon a lot um, with CID, um, which to me was a great experience there of traveling. We went to, um, I was called out of the field as one of 13 people. I was the only woman in, in criminal investigator. And so I was naturally one of them called out. And we went back to the training center at Fort McClellan, Alabama. They said they were having so much trouble there, the provost marshal was complaining a lot. And they said, we'll send you back there under Department of Army, not post. We went in and they set aside one of the BOQs and no one but no one could be in there but us. And then we started working. We worked 10 days and nights and we cleaned up the post. But while we were at it, the, the uh, major in charge asked me, he says, now, from what you've seen, what are your suggestions to actually get this post operating right? This is a big training center for women. I said, bodily lift out all your cadre and all your commanding officers and executive officers and ship them different places. Don't let any two go anywhere together. Bring in from the field all new personnel, all from different parts of the section that don't know one another, and set them in here and start over again. And they did it. That was quite an accomplishment. Well, I thank you, Miss Ethel, for sharing your recollections with us. Uh, it'll, it'll, be, it'll turn out real well. We appreciate it. All thank right. You.